In the early spring of 1940, the foremost Hungarian composer of the day, Béla Bartók, traveled to Washington, D.C. to give a recital of works for piano and violin at the Library of Congress with his compatriot, the violinist Josef Zygeti. Although this wasn't his first visit to America, the circumstances surrounding the journey were particularly dramatic. The descent of Hungary into fascism during the 1930s had made life in Bartok's native land intolerable for the composer, and the American trip was undertaken with the intent of determining whether life as an exile in the New World would be professionally feasible. The Washington concert and the tour that followed convinced Bartok that a temporary relocation to the United States was realistic, and with this in mind, he returned to Hungary in May to put his affairs in order. He retired from his post at the Budapest Music Academy and asked his friend and colleague Zoltan Kodai to take over his folk music research at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. He drew up a will specifying that no street or square should be given his name or plaque erected in his honor, as long as Budapest landmarks carried the names of Mussolini and Hitler. After he and his wife Dita, who was also an accomplished pianist, gave a farewell concert on October 8th, the couple set off on a long journey through Yugoslavia, Italy, Switzerland, France, and Spain before reaching Lisbon and boarding a ship bound for the United States. When the Bartoks arrived in New York on October 30th, 1940, they were psychologically unprepared for the challenges they would face. The move to America had been predicated, in part, on a position as an ethnomusicologist at Columbia University and a series of concert engagements. The job at Columbia was in fact a fellowship that was limited to the organization and transcription of a collection of field recordings of Serbo-Croatian folk music made by a recently deceased professor of classics at Harvard. Milman Perry. Although Bartok found this work both immensely rewarding and far preferable to the teaching positions he'd been offered, the fellowship was subject to renewal every six months. The precariousness of this assignment became clear when Columbia determined that it could no longer be funded. Friends of the composer stepped into the breach and raised the funds necessary to sustain his position, although this was done in secret. Bartok's attitude towards accepting anything he identified as charity was notoriously puritanical. Additionally, many of the concert appearances he'd counted upon didn't materialize, as Bartok's European managers proved themselves ineffective in addressing the challenges of booking professional engagements in America, which became even more daunting once the country entered the World War in December of 1941. Hovering above all these circumstances was the deterioration of Bartok's health. A diminutive man with a fragile constitution, he'd been prone to illness all his life and had even battled tuberculosis as a student. In April of 1942, he began to suffer from raging fevers and weight loss. By early 1943, he was experiencing temperatures as high as 104 and his weight had fallen to 87 pounds. Finally, after collapsing during a lecture, he was brought to a hospital. Once again, Bartok's friends rallied on his behalf. Although he was not a member, the American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers, commonly known as ASCAP, covered all his medical expenses. Of almost equal importance was an intervention by Zygeti, who approached the conductor of the Boston Symphony, Serge Kuzovitsky, about commissioning a new work. Kuzovitsky responded with enthusiasm, and in May he visited the composer in the sanatorium where he was being treated and asked him to write a piece at the behest of the Kuzovitsky Foundation for a fee of $1,000, half of which was to be paid immediately. Bartok's reluctance to accept the down payment wasn't simply a matter of pride. Both men realized that the state of the composer's health made the likelihood of his completing the piece an open question. <laughs> Nonetheless, within weeks of Kuzovitsky's visit, Dita Bartok was writing to Zygeti to thank him. I am so glad that plans, musical ambitions, and compositions are stirring in Bela's mind, a new hope discovered in this way quite by chance. One thing is sure, for the first time in more than three years, Bela's under no circumstances will I ever write any new work attitude has gone. Although Bartok was in fact living on borrowed time, an eventual diagnosis of leukemia would seal his fate. By July of 1943, his health had improved enough to travel to Saranac Lake, New York to continue his recuperation, with all expenses paid by the indispensable ASCAP. 
By the end of August, he felt strong enough to begin working on the Kuzovitsky Commission. In spite of his hiatus from composing, the work went rapidly, and by the time he returned to New York City in October, he'd completed a five-movement, 40-minute orchestral piece to which he gave the title Concerto for Orchestra. From the time of its premiere in Boston on December 1st, 1944 to the present day, this work has remained one of Bartok's most beloved compositions. In addition to providing the composer a professional triumph at a time when it was sorely needed, the piece initiated a final radiant burst of creativity that would produce his solo violin sonata, his third piano concerto, and the sketches for his viola concerto. In spite of the dire circumstances under which this music was written, it is utterly free of self-pitying expression. What emerges instead from these pages is an unrestricted embrace of life's potential fullness that projects the image of a great artist at the height of his powers, whose creative intellect and spirit remained undiminished even as his physical form wasted away. The profound sense of authenticity and personal integrity that brought this music into being was movingly captured in the violinist Yehudi Menuhin's description of Bartok during his final years. His appearance belied the unfathomable fire and power of his character. His presence gave no evidence of the barbaric grandeur or the mystic vision of his innermost self. Only those eyes, those fantastically piercing eyes, gave him away. They betrayed his burning soul while his body, almost consumed, jealously guarded its last strength.